Um, so the next presentation uh, is by Ken Alvord. Um, he's the head of customer success at CNTXT, uh, a joint venture between Aramco or with, a, with Aramco, and is based in Riyadh. Uh, he works with a wide range of customers and asset-intensive industries focusing on digital transformation and cloud enablement. Um, <clears throat> he focuses on cr creating trustable and contextualized OT, IT, and ET data to ensure that the full potential of AI capabilities can be unlocked. He used to work for uh, Cognite uh, in Oslo, uh, Norway, and has got a lot of field experience, uh, field development experience, having worked in multinational energy services companies in Norway, Brazil, and Malaysia. He holds a master's degree in international energy management and policy from Columbia, and a bachelor's degree in philosophy and government from Lawrence University. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, a couple of uh, um, things as I introduce myself. I'm conscious that we're on the last day. We have uh, uh, only, I think, one presentation after me. So I will try to be as uh, animated and excitable to keep the energy up. Uh, I'm also thankful to be uh, to hear your presentation at Sabic, by the way. It's very, very interesting and very, very ambitious and uh, great. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I want to thank uh, Kaust and the Yahya at the Ministry of Energy for asking me to come speak. Uh, my name is Ken, and I've lived here now one year and three days uh, in Riyadh. And um, which way is the advance? There we are. So I want to talk a little bit uh, about our roots, or what is CNTXT, or we'll say context, minus the vowels, I guess. Um, uh, so our company was formed as a joint venture, uh, majority owned by Saudi Aramco, uh, late last year. Um, and the other shareholder is a company called Cognite, which is where I come from in Norway. Um, the aim of this is to provide uh, the industrial expertise, uh, the breadth, for, certainly for the economy here, but globally in the energy industry that Aramco brings, uh, together with uh, what Cognite has, which is uh, really a mix between software that's industrially focused, right? So the data science part with leading IT um, uh, natives. -y. So uh, like I said, we just started uh, last August uh, here in the kingdom. Um, so I was part of the initial team. And I want to talk to you a little bit today about, uh, about the data problem underneath the AI, right? We know that the large trends are this. One, AI is still, is, we find value, but it's really in its infancy of where it's going to progress. We also know that we need to commercialize this and scale this in the industry to really add the value. The great part is the IT is getting easier. Low code, no code, everybody knows chat GPT now. Maybe they're writing, auto-responding to people with this if they want on email. Um, and you also have, natively, the students of today are growing up with coding as part of their literature. So the citizen data scientist, that bar for a 40-year-old is quite, uh, quite high. And there's very few uh, globally that can do this. But for the 20-year-old, for the 15-year-old, this will get easier. So we'll have these converging to really be a driving force um, for this. And combining that with Vision 2030, I'm, I couldn't be happier to be in this country. I think the, all of you are here right now. If you live here, it's, uh, there's not many places in the world like this right now. So uh, I want to talk a bit uh, about um, what, what we do or what we're trying to do. So uh, instead of talking about an industry thing, let's talk about something everybody knows, which is Google Maps, right? Um, so why is Google Maps uh, useful and interesting, right? It's a, it's a single map that's visual. You have multiple overlays. Um, additionally to the map, you have, say, metadata, right? Uh, that data could be traffic, uh, especially if you're in Riyadh. That's a, a daily event. Um, if you're, um, uh, but it could be for a business, hours of operation, phone number, et cetera, right? It interprets the meanings of the query, even from Google search engines. Very good if you just ask it a question in a question form. Um, but it interprets those and provides a unified um, uh, interface that you can get almost everything you want out of it. You know, most of you, if I poll, know how Google Maps works and when to use it. Um, and the great part also is that through this automation that they have, uh, it all allows the different users to have this. So why is Uber successful in part? Because they're able to just build on top of it, right? They didn't have to build all that infrastructure underneath there and try to, try to chase that along with, the, with everybody else. So for us, 
um, from context and particularly to solve the data problem underneath, we do a bit of the same thing, right? So your maps now are various forms of, um, it can be a point cloud, it can be um, uh, step files, 3Ds, PNIDs, schematics, right? And then where it really works, and this is where the industrial problem lies, is that mixture of not just your PNID uh, piping and instrumentation diagram, uh, but it's also uh, having that against your historian, right? Uh, it's also having that against your SAP data, so your en engineering doc other engineering documents you might need, sensors as talked about, videos, images. Um, and it also has human semantics, so it's a bit of training on the queries uh, that we have, but it can enable AI or rules-based mechanisms quite easily. And the main value for us, and this is about how to do well in the ecosystem, uh, we're in Aramco's, Aramco's corporate network quite heavily uh, already, is that we want to be an enabler for, for you. So I, I hear the last couple, two days I'm here, and there's wonderful things, half of the words I had to look up, I'll be honest, uh, because you're doing some really advanced stuff. And then when I think about those, those will lead toward applications, toward optimization, toward solvers, right? It's the next Bentley, whatever. Um, we want to be that, lot other, or the problem underneath is to be able to have easily accessible, persistent, clear data to be able to iterate quickly, right? So, why do, so how does AI grow is the quick time of iteration. It's agile methodology, but it's also reliable data. So uh, just quick, even though we just started in August and I'm some American who might have a slight Norwegian twinge in his accent because I've lived there too long. Um, so even though we're fairly new here, we're pretty well known globally. Uh, we started in the energy industry, uh, moved to a lot of uh, quite a substantial amount of manufacturing as well as in the utility sector. Um, for upstream, for instance, SLB, otherwise known as Schlumberger, is actually builds all of their upstream uh, uh, solutions on top of our platform. Uh, Rockwell Automation, do the same. Uh, so those are the hopefully names that you, that you know. Um, also for the kingdom side, Aramco is actually an investor uh, toward Cognite itself, and then obviously that uh, shows the, the sponsorship. But we try to really focus ourselves in the industrial sector, right? Because uh, uh, we know that if it's just strictly enterprise data, if we go to a bank, this is, there's, there's a lot of great platforms out there uh, for us. Our, our, we really try to stick in the niche um, on the industrial side. And I think um, to use, for instance, Bob Longer at MIT's line, right, the three steps toward research, right, is invent, protect, commercialize, right? Always in that order, invent, protect, commercialize. Probably I'm focusing on the commercializing side. Many of you are focusing on the event side or invent side. Uh, but it's very important um, in that regard as you're growing to be able to invent the right thing, right, to be able to get research on that layer underneath it. So why does this problem matter? Um, this statistic is getting older and older, and yet it's still useful because uh, 3.1 trillion is a lot of money, and this is just one country. And think about the data that we used in 2016 versus seven years, uh, or now seven years forward, today. Think about, you have a question about sensors or new things adding. Think about the data that's coming tomorrow, right? And already that loss is there, and we're fighting everybody, and all the, the key players like Sabic uh, uh, and, and, and others are fighting to keep pushing upstream on this to reduce that, to maximize their value uh, for their company. Uh, but this still means a lot even back then, and I'm quite sure it's much more. Uh, this was IBM's uh, data. So it, it, in, in the reality, I mean, when we're talking about AI, without good data quality, right, we know it undermines, right? You can interpolate a little bit, but, or, but if your data sample is small or unreliable, uh, this disallows your analytics, right? And on the business sense, if you have bad analytics, you're making the wrong business decision, simply put. And ultimately, it's a, a revenue and cost issue, right? It's the CEO talking on a quarterly basis that says, look, we're not making as much money as we should be. Um, so while it might seem sometimes abstract or, or the infrastructure or the plumbing underneath the house, it's wildly important to get that part right to unlock everything you want above it. So... Um, if we talk about organic development of digital applications without a, a transformation plan or a platform, right, uh, you have, in our view, three parts, right? There's an application space, which is as wider than my arms could go. Um, you have a lot of data science workflows, Plotly Dash, Power BI, these types of dashboards. Um, and you have anal en engineering analytics tools, so like a Bentley, like I said, Aspen Unified, uh, these types of things. And the thing is that as, the prob as we try to, particularly for AI, try to really kind of crack the nut to be able to unleash that value, 
You're going to need data from a lot of different areas that don't relate to each other and don't talk to each other necessarily. Um, and this is particularly important for the industry because you have things that are working since 1950. And if it's not broke, don't fix it. But what happens when you need to add a new area that connects with it that's just from this year is a very different um, you know, pneumatic device versus something that's fully autonomous to, or digital. So you have a lot of these sources, and then what do you do? You create what we like to call spaghetti. Uh, sorry, I know it's lunchtime, so I'll stop uh, with the food references. <laughs> and that's good, and that's really good, uh, because you're, if you're able to extract those and persist the data and keep the cl uh, cleanliness, it's great. But again, there's new data tomorrow. There's new things coming for us. So how do you future-proof that? Because when you have spaghetti, and if any of you worked in IT, and you have a new column you need on a free form, that creates a bit of a problem for you, right? There's a new config file in the time series that you need from Pi. These are actually the problems that stop innovation, right? So this is where we try to come in as this group, that, uh, as this area that can enable it. And look, I, I'm, be frank, it's academic comfort. not the only people in the world. We just know there's a niche here. Um, and this is also for, the, for, um, uh, for partnering in the Middle East and, the, and, and in the kingdom. Uh, this is our mission and, and context to be able, as much as possible, to be a partner with the, the workflows that you already have, that you want to grow, with the, whatever, the, the Aspen Unifieds that you really want to keep using for your PIMS if you're running that. We don't want to stop that. We just want to make sure you're able to grow that and you're able to rely on that data. So uh, several ways to solve the problem. The, but the first part is actually this, uh, from 2019, the data ops functionality. And if we take that generically, what does that mean, right? It's that from an IT perspective, you have a development environment support. Uh, you see several groups listed here. You have, access, you have control of the data, right? And I'm sorry to pick on Sabic, but it was the last one in his industry focus. So, so you can have a global part, but he's got, this, uh, this gentleman needs to make sure that their factory in the US, only the right people have the access to that data because it's a, it's a, it becomes a security issue, right? So you have to have good policies there. Then it's version control. Somebody has a good idea, they update, a, uh, they update a, a table. And you need to know that now there's been an up rev, there's a change of, the, change of a dynamic. As you get into more AI and passive updating, you need that version control because if in a trading situation, Platts has told you that the oil data has changed, you need to know that there is an adjustment. It can run on its own, the machine can run, but you have to know that something's there to know why maybe you got an outcome you didn't expect. Then finally, the orchestration of the pipelines. Right? So if we go back to the spaghetti, <clears throat> but let's say you need some uh, 3D file, but then this gentleman here also needs that 3D file in the same company, right? You have the pipeline that you can just reuse. Let's not reinvent the wheel and create a consulting, uh, consulting bonanza of integration pipelines. Uh, then the lineage, uh, right? So the, the dependency, how do you trace it? I mean, it's a lot of these things on a business level are just layers of abstraction. So how do we get down to the root and step our way down and automate up, right? And then finally, the observability um, to inspect and monitor uh, this, right? And, and monitoring compliance, quality, proactive alerting if something isn't going right. So, and then for us, where we think about industry part, right? That works in general, should apply to everybody on the left, but on the right, it's the support types, right? So you have semi-structured data. P and IDs might be a really common knowledge for us in industry, but if I'm in the um, banking sector, it means nothing, say. Um, and then the types of equipments, uh, domain languages. Let's talk about tubes, pipes, right? Uh, you use wall thickness is always metric, for instance, right? And ODID is always imperial, right? This is a rule, but you have to know these certain things uh, for it. Um, access, uh, governance, discovery, uh, and, and then uh, the ability to incorporate physics. Like I said, it's not generically needed that we use physics. In this room, we probably do. But uh, in industry, we also do. Um, so what we do is try to say that, look, we're not generic, can do everything, but these are some of the features of data ops that are really important, we think, for industry itself. So as you take your ideas from the academic side into the commercial, uh, into the commercial world, we're also trying to support that uh, aspect because it, uh, in order for it to scale successfully. So quite uh, similar, as I said, about the fusing of the data, right? So you have the uh, conventional IT data, hierarchies, then you get to the P&IDs and engineering documents, time series, events, simulations, unstructured documents as well. Um, and then you also have the visuals. Some of those are nice to look at, but some of them are very necessary 
if you're in a complex environment or a, a facility. Um, and then what we do is build, a, uh, build and maintain these relationships real time, or as real time as the data source allows us to. Right? And so you can do event-based if you need like a Kafka queue, um, uh, but you also can run on series if it's, a, if it's batch processing. Um, and then we focus on matching the resource types uh, and contextualizing, which is maybe an arcane word, but really the contextualize is just to make sense of these varying, various types of data that, don't, that are very interlinked, but not always related to each other. And to that extent, we also try to be, be flexible because uh, I'm quite sure Saudi Electric's asset heart, or modeling will be slightly different than Sabex modeling, right? Will be very different from Obicon's modeling, will be very different from Almirai's modeling, right? So we have to be flexible while still industrial focused, and we have that capability. Furthermore, documents, this can be a nightmare of a junior employee to have to go through and <laughs> try to parse through manually. Um, uh, so we do it through OCR recognition and otherwise that. And also then templatizing um, the data. So uh, the five main parts of the data problem underneath that we try to focus on is the time series, docs, sequences, visual data, and then event base. Um, and then as you build a knowledge graph uh, for it, you're setting this relational um, uh, set for who's produced by, who's connecting to. And I think this in the, at least from the time I've had with R&D or working with that, uh, or in EPC projects, is wildly important to get yourself from concept to feed to EPC to commissioning to operations to end of life. And to, that's the thread that you'll need to relate them. And the relations will change over time and you need to adapt. I do know okay on time. Okay. So just a quick example, and even something you could, an AI kind of inside of uh, a CDF. So let's say you have a lot of uncontextualized data from a platform and you see all the various logos from here, um, and let's say you just take time series and assets, right? So you have uh, quite a few unmatched. You can just run a rules engine against it very quickly uh, to generate rules based off the data um, to match uh, with confidence intervals and also demonstrate conflicts. And then from that, now your SME is reviewing this small subset where, there, where it's needed, right? Um, even talking with some folks in Aramco last week in a meeting, Right? Uh, when you're doing some of their simulations, there's 11,000 variables. And they're running on gut feeling a lot. Uh, and they're taking a lot of time. And even sometimes the solver doesn't see a flaw. So how do you try to proactively do this to validate quickly, early, uh, to maximize your time to be proactive? Because I think the number one thing I see with it is so many groups that, that are struggling toward trying to get toward AI, it's getting the data problem underneath to let them even be proactive instead of reactive. So the biggest thing for, from our side, if I'm just to put it this way, to solve the data problem, right, is that, and this is more from a manufacturing perspective, I tried to mix it up a little, right, is you have to make the data available. I think by and large, companies are, are providing endpoints. We're able to get access to these uh, parts. And I think by and large, we're finding we have a lot of good simulator, data science tools, industry applications, but max get, getting, really solving those complex problems that have very different data in order to be able to acquire the knowledge is where we're coming in. And the way that you're able to make decisions off of it, right, is that number four, the trust part. It's not just the security, it's infra, it's the access, it's all those data ops things. That's wildly important. And to be honest, having been here, like I said, 367, 68 days, um, and really excited about Vision 2030 and what the kingdom is doing, but this huge jump in technology means that this thing underneath it is maybe the forgotten aspect that's wildly important to enable you. Because you can have fourth industrial revolution here, but if you want to scale that across all your bulk plants, across all your production facilities, it's the area underneath that actually is necessary to be able to iterate quickly, to grow and to learn. Um, and to be able to do that, you're, you, know, you don't think twice when you open the faucet in your house, right? You need to assume water comes out. So it's the same way with data. If you want to do AI, you need to assume that that data is going to come out and you can trust it. So I picked four examples, uh, and I'll try to go fairly quick. I picked four examples that are as different as I could find them. The, I've loved from the academic side how much sharing on individual problems and the analysis um, that you've been able to do. The problem on our side is while we can talk about customers, most customers don't want us to talk about their individual, assign the problem to them. So some things I have to be generic about. But I come from uh, the area that actually I started with um, 
going in toward the trading sector. Right, so if you think of a, an oil trader, right, it's almost like alchemy. It's not really science, to, to be in my opinion. So, but they have all different areas that they're trying to get data, right? And it's growing. And you have alt data now that you're running on, um, models, all these things. And how do you make a decision? If I'm, if I'm uh, uh, or the ATC for Aramco, and I'm taking offtake, how do I make a decision that maximizes in a global environment where we're sitting at the center? Um, and so oftentimes then we try to build um, in the case of models, so for shipping insights, for instance, we had manual vessel monitoring um, and insights, Excel-based, phone calls, et cetera, and you don't have a global forecast. So in this case, the next step was to create that algorithmic forecast um, to be able to structure the data and make it accessible. And the real thing come, came actually is that, as you know, at the end of February, we had quite a geopolitical disruption in the market, right? Couldn't get, say, grain out of the Black Sea. Right, the diesel price has changed. Then, month uh, right around then, I think we have that the thing that became an infamous meme. There's a green vessel in the Suez Canal stopped. Right, ship flow stopped. So you might have the world's best model, you might have made that, but guess what? There's a super event that changed it, and how is your data going to adapt to that? It's not thinking of that. So what do you need? Adaptability, resilience underneath. So this is what we're trying to focus on. Uh, for instance, with this. So then I want to take us all the way to a different area, and I'm really sorry it's so vague, I just really couldn't <laughs> share more. Um, there's a group that wanted, a big uh, builder and a manager of housing, wanted to measure carbon footprint, because we know about what a quarter of, uh, generally about a quarter of um, energy consumption is, is from residential, uh, tell me if I'm wrong. Um, but you also know everybody lives in a place, so everybody's actually a contributor toward this. Um, so they wanted to kind of see if they could crowdsource initially in a laboratory environment. They created, built a place where people are living uh, to see how they could find what motivates and well, how do you reduce individual carbon footprint, right? So we have 8 billion people or 8.5 we're at. Uh, you know, a 10% drop is a huge difference. So you start small, uh, but you have to create that data foundation and the model. And what was particularly important there is this was GDPR. Right, and we all know GDPR, I assume, for personal protection, privacy, is how do you then take what was our industrial part, reassign the asset hierarchy to an apartment, so you can imagine there's a bit, what's your asset, right? <laughs> what are different values? What are events? Uh, and then also you need to anonymize it uh, because of personal protection laws in the jurisdiction we were in. Um, and then we focus on the monitoring and the functions. And in this regard, they're actually using this. We don't develop the front end. They're doing this and getting startups and also other companies they've contracted to build applications on top, to try this in the market, right? So you're enabling now 10 groups to work with the data. Third part, uh, let's go to Latin America and let's talk pipelines. Um, so we engaged with a company that was um, working with one of the largest uh, pipeline operators in Latin America. This group had a great product. Uh, a very, they're a very well-known company. And they had a really good AI group, but they had a big problem in their pilot and POC, is that they couldn't keep the data connection correct. Things were changing, they wanted to add a new facility, and they couldn't get it. So they, they came to us, and they said, all right, uh, we've worked together along the way, can you get the data from the sensor, from the, the, say the Honeywell system? Can you get the SAP data? Can you get the Pi data? Expose it the way that we need to, so our AI can actually do the value that it, that it, that it makes. In this regard, we accomplished that. This case, the first development, I think, take eight weeks, and then the next development of equivalent size, two weeks, right? Because you reuse the pipelines, everything worked. Um, and so that's the part toward enabling their AI that you can start to see the exponential scaling capability. And finally, uh, we don't talk as much, I haven't talked as much here, but our company context has two other areas that we focus on. First, we're the exclusive reseller for Google Cloud, which will arrive later this year in the kingdom. The Sadaya has said several times they'll stop funding servers uh, or subsidizing them as much. Uh, we're trying to be cloud first, and now it will be CNI compliant that you'll have uh, one of the big three in the kingdom. So we work with this. And while we try to mostly make sense of this data, allow you to host correctly, scale correctly, um, we also have a partnership or uh, agreement with toward uh, Boston Dynamics on robotics um, to, work, uh, to work also with them to create data where we need to create data. Um, because we do know, uh, particularly from the example on the drones, the data doesn't even sense it, it won't always work the right way. 
uh, due to difficulty of in the industrial, uh, com the complexity of industry, let's say. So our typical way there is you're connecting those to the cloud. Uh, we're also thinking about fleet management of robots. We're, some groups are struggling with one, but imagine 10 years from now where we're gonna be. Multiple robots t needing to communicate with each other, helping humans on the assembly line at some point. Doing the repetitive tasks that maybe aren't good, doing the dangerous tasks that we don't really wanna put people in harm's way for, right? And enabling that data to be able to further unlock uh, with ML models and AI. So those are just four, I try to have different groups. So in summary, um, I think industry lacks simple access to data. There's a lot of siloing uh, trying to go and we need to really horizontally democratize that as much as possible or allow that data to be prevalent as much as possible. Um, and really from experience also with Cognit, like there's so many times that the AI is great from that example like in the pipeline, but we can't get access to it and it's preventing us. It's gonna hold us back. And if we don't think about this now and only focus on the top, we're gonna have great things that don't work. It's gonna be like a semiconductor for 10 or 15 years, right? Um, and then finally, the business impact uh, must be delivered faster. So not only does it need to have value engineering make sense financially, uh, but it must go faster and faster. Because guess what? The tech, in, if I come here a year from now, the tech's gonna be very different than it is today. It's not chat GPT, it's some other thing is hot, and guess what, everything's moved. So you need the right infrastructure to be able to host yourself, uh, to scale yourself, uh, and really to do your research, to do, uh, solve your business problems. Uh, you need a reliable platform or reliable data underneath it, this to be able to iterate your AI and mature your idea. So, that's me. Thank you. Um, time for a couple of questions. Thank you for the presentation. My question is on the last two slides that you've had. For me personally, I'm aware of the CF, CDF. Uh, my question is on the interaction or the interconnect between CDF and Google Cloud. Yeah. I know that it's going to be available or they are planning to make it available later in 2023. Yeah. What, what's the link here? Are you guys in partnership or just going to capitalize on that provision? And how does this align with Aramco's and Saudi Arabia kind of? Okay, so that, there's a couple different ways. Well, let's start with Aramco. Yeah. So Aramco, CDF has one, uh, we're cloud-based, but it's one um, on-premise deployment, which is at Aramco. Mm -hmm. In this case, it would use industrial Wi-Fi uh, to get back to the corporate network. If it's image processing, you'd run an edge device to process and then you send a data signal so we don't have somebody really upset with me in North Park or okay. El Nidra. Um, the, the next question came on the partnership, or I'll take that one, with Google. Context is the exclusive reseller for Google Cloud. It's not saying that we are the exclusive implementer, like a provider if you're gonna move to cloud uh, once that comes, but we have the resale exclusivity and contact that comes from Aramco and some other space behind. Um, and then in terms of the CDF, or using CDF in the kingdom, we are very much looking forward to doing this as a cloud base as soon as GCP is ready um, with us. So there'll be a separate instance. So if I go to your, whatever, your company for instance and you want to buy this, you could, uh, once this is in the kingdom, then resident in the kingdom, then you could uh, use a CDF cloud instance. And that's very quick because it's, no, nature of cloud. When you say the exclusive, you mean you are the only entity um, licensed? Context is the only entity allowed to sell, <coughs> like the sell, the right. license of GCP. Thank you. Okay, one more question. Yes, thank you. So that is so much for the great presentation. I have just one question about the Aramco Digital. Yes. Uh, what's the difference between the two companies? <laughs> yeah. Aramco and Aramco Digital? Is the question? No, context. Uh, no. Ah, okay. Um, so that's that's the. Is, are you? Where, where is your background? Uh, I see. You will see me after this. Presentation. Okay, you're Saudi electric. Okay, because <laughs> it's a very. Uh, but it's a it's a question I got yesterday at yeah. uh, Arc. So, <laughs> so okay. it's something. Um, so uh, Aramco Digital uh, is, to my knowledge, uh, what they've announced at Ictiva, right? Is a new company uh, that will have its own. Let's say. Um, ecosystem of, of flagships or verticals um, form in, formally. I don't have an opinion of how that uh, impacts context. I can only say that because we are 51% owned Aramco, I'm sure that uh, uh, Abu Marwan and, and Anasser and everybody and, and El Sadi will make sure that there's a good cooperation there, however that takes place. 
Okay. Thank you very much. With that, we'll just thank our speaker. Thanks.